everybody's seeking to be saved in one way or another, whether they're turning to drugs or alcohol or whatever coping mechanism, but they're not finding the true salvation from their struggles. What's up, buddy? It's your boy, Stephen Blake. Welcome back to our first episode of this podcast, The Found Podcast, where we talk about faith, Christianity, all that jazz. I'm super excited, super pumped. Our first guest is Brooke Jordan. Hi. Yours truly right here. All right. Basically, I'm asking the question. She's talking. Whatever she wants to talk about, Mike is hers. So first question is, give us a little bit of a brief background about like, who you are, your story, where you're from, all this kind of stuff. Okay, so hi, I'm Brooke. Um, I am originally from the Palm Springs area, California. So basically moved one desert to the other. Um, I right now work as an executive assistant at a global consulting firm. Basically that just means scheduling and rescheduling the same meetings. Um, I'm just, like what? <laughs> What else you want to know, Blake? How about, Any specifics? How about just like some about like your upbringing? Like okay. I know you're a, pa- a pastor's kid, essentially a PK, yep. right? Tell me about what that was like growing up as a kid. Okay. Um, I mean, it's kind of different because you have two conflicting perspectives. On one hand, people expect you to be perfect all the time and not ever sin or mess up. And then on the other hand, you have the people that expect you to be a rebel and say pastors, kids are the worst. Well, that's kind of true. It depends on who you are. But growing up, having those two conflicting things, it's really hard to balance. Um, I typically fell in the rebellious side. My brother fell into the angel child. um, And people just put that label on you. And so you kind of have to grow up with these expectations of being perfect or you're set to a different standard. And uh, yeah, I fell short most of the time. I mean, elementary school, I was pretty, I don't know. I was still sinful. We always are. We were born born that way, but I was pretty chill up until left the nest and then went to college, decided to be a little wild child, took after both of my parents and their rebellious sinning years of being a prodigal and so having said all that what have you kind of learned about i guess yourself in that process of like from childhood to maturation i'll probably go into like more of your testimony of sorts right yeah okay go ahead and and share that if you would a little bit yeah um i mean it's hard because on yeah you're expected to be one way but then you know you're a sinner and God has just shown me a lot through all of my years of turning him away and just being stubborn and trying to do things on my own that I can't do it on my own. Like there's nothing that I can do that will save me, that'll earn me eternity with him in heaven and that I'm always going to fall short. And it just took a lot of error and feeling the pain and the hurt of what sin eventually does and what the Bible says it'll do of just causing death, not only in our physical bodies, because yeah, we're going to die. Like that's just the way it is. And that's the consequence of what happened in the garden, but also just dying internally with pain and hurt and all the other things that come with the choices and decisions that we make. So took a lot and I essentially had to hit rock bottom and get to the end of myself to realize that I was never going to be able to save myself. And then God came in and was like, Hey, I've always been here, but like, do you trust me? And I was like, okay, my way didn't work. So let's try yours. Cause I can't do it anymore. Describe what that moment was like when I guess, for example, you found God because you know, the God doesn't need to find you. You're, yeah. He's already, you already know where you are all the time. Like, a right. la Garden of Eden. Like, where are you? Like, I know where you are, duh. But like, describe like that moment that you found God. Because you grew up in a Christian home too with your dad. So like, was that a different moment compared to like other f- Christian friends that you have? Or what was that like? I mean, growing up in a Christian home, you already know about the Lord. You already know about Jesus and what he did on the cross for you. And you've you have all this biblical knowledge, but... 
I would say I didn't really understand the the deep need for God to save me and the gravity of sin. And so I claimed I was a Christian my whole life. Like, that's all I knew. I was living a Christian life on the outside for the most part, but like I wasn't in a close knit relationship with God. And so I didn't really see a difference until my prodigal years. And I knew that I was choosing to live a life of sin. Like I, I made that distinction in my head. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this my way. And that's that. And so I would say that turning point to where it truly hit, I just, the decisions I was making and the things that I was doing caused so much brokenness and my relationship with my parents, my friends, I was living a lie. I was in secrecy in so many different areas. And like, I just hit a rock bottom that I'd never experienced before and just God met me there. And it was different because this time I was like, okay, I've explored all of the other options that life has to offer and none of them work out. And so I think the turnaround was just really me finally seeing like, I need God. I need him to save me. Like there is no way, no other way that can save me outside of him and his grace and mercy in what he did sending Jesus to save us on the cross. So I think in that moment, it all finally clicked and I was able to just fully devote myself to him. And yes, I still slipped up and I still sin. Like we're human beings, we're gonna sin. Nobody was perfect outside of Jesus, but the way that I live my life is completely different. And God just keeps revealing himself in the years since then. Tell me about what that is like now from that period before kind of the the BC of course, or BC of sorts, before Christ, as opposed, yeah. juxtaposing that with now where you're at in your life with how kind of, you know, God's transformed you in that. Yeah, I mean, it's night and day, even in the last, cause that turning point was in 2020, but even from 2020 to, I would say this year, 2023, the beginning of it, totally different, like still a baby in my faith and like, yeah, I have all this head knowledge about God, but the the fruit of my faith was not nearly where it is now. The dependency on him was not where it is. The closeness, the revelation, the way that I can just hear God and see God and understand him reading his word. And like, it's just grown in a depth that has never been there and it keeps growing. And I guess just the biggest transformations is in my desire to serve him. Um, like I can't, I can't get enough. Like I serve on a billion different teams and it's not to say, oh, look at me. I do all these great things for God, but it's like, no, like I love him so much. Like I want to further his kingdom as much as possible and like share what he's done in my life and how he can save other people. Cause everybody's seeking to be saved in one way or another, whether they're turning to drugs or alcohol or whatever coping mechanism, but they're not finding the key to true salvation from their struggles. And so I just, I don't know, want to help as much as I can. And God's grown me from being super judgmental and self-righteous and like holier than thou. And like, well, at least I don't do those sins. Like, okay, Miss Girl, you've done, (laughs) you've done a lot of things that other people have not. Like, who am I to judge? Like, Jesus didn't judge. He was perfect. He had never sinned. And yet he still spoke and cared for and loved on others with such compassion and just grace and forgiveness. Um, So he's grown me a lot in that area, which has been awesome to see. Hmm, That's awesome. Well, talking about the ways in which you've grown and how you've kind of transitioned in this period, talk about what that looks like in terms of like evangelism to others. Because, I mean, call it like three or four, five, six years ago, I'm sure you wouldn't have had like the boldness or like the the heart and the head knowledge to be able to speak and proclaim gospel to people who weren't Christians yet, right? Talk about yeah. what that experience has been like for you. Um, it's definitely been a turnaround and it's still something I struggle with, don't get me wrong. Um, but I never shared about my faith. Like <laughs> looking back at the beginning stages of 
you know, God transforming me. It was very much so like, we don't need to talk about this. And from the outside, I didn't look any different than the world. Like I still cussed like a sailor and all these other things. And like, if I would have tried speaking about my faith then when God was still working in those areas, they probably would have been like, well, why do I need Jesus? Like your life looks no different than mine. And so I didn't share because I do. And deep down I was like, yeah, okay, I'm living one foot in the world and one foot not. And through time and just him changing and transforming and convicting me in certain areas, like now I still have to pray about it. And there's still things that make me uncomfortable more so because I don't want to push somebody away. And I have to just come to the realization that like God is so much bigger than anything that I can say. And like, if he's going to reach someone, he is going to reach someone. And I mean, you have to just kind of go into it being like, okay, God use me in whatever capacity, in whatever way, help me to just share and meet somebody where they're at. And so that looks differently. Like sometimes you don't think that you're making an impact or that people are seeing, but people notice when you don't live the way you do. And when they ask questions, like you don't always have to come out and be like, do you know what Jesus did on the cross for you? And like come at it super abrupt and super harsh. But if people at work are like, oh, you're not drinking or you're not like, oh, so sorry. Like, I know you don't cuss. Like, I'm sorry. Or that allows for an opportunity for them to ask, like, why is that? And then I get the opportunity to be like, well, you know, the Bible and like I'm following Jesus and get to share that way to where it's softer um, and just, yeah, meet them where they're at. Have some friends that are really struggling and I get to try to (laughs) essentially speak into their lives using the Bible and what the Lord would say to them, but without being as explicit about it. And it hits different and they receive it. And then from there, it's just a matter of like working up and speaking out in boldness and being like, hey, take this or leave this. But I just wanted you to know that Jesus loves you and that he will never leave you or forsake you. And he's chasing after you, whether you accept him or not. But he's always there. He's always going to be there. And it that speaks to people. For sure. Mm -hmm. And those are powerful words too. Like when you say something like that, it just kind of like rocks them. Like Jesus loves you. And you're like, huh? Like, Like, what does that even mean? Yeah, like what, why? Like for what reason? Like, because he loved you first. And it's like, you didn't do anything. It's like, I was messed up as I was, but it's like, yep, God loves me through it all. And Jesus loves me through it all. Mm -hmm. That's the crazy part. And speaking about kind of the ways in which you've impacted people, is there like a specific instance you can think of that comes to mind with like being able to plant those seeds, but then also to see the fruits of that labor kind of come to fruition? Um, It's a little early to speak on that. There are plenty of seeds and specific examples I can think of where the gospel has been shared, but the Lord still has to do a lot of work. And ultimately, I just need to keep loving on these people and um, sharing, but God's got to soften their hearts a little bit and let it sink in of how much they truly need. So I'm hoping and praying to see the fruits of those. Um, But if not, I can rest assured knowing that the Lord has them and whether it's something I say or maybe years down the road and they hit a situation or meet somebody else who makes it click, then that's awesome if they come to know him. But yeah. Okay. Gotcha. What about, let's say for example, I know you don't want to pitch the gospel. It's not like a marketing scam or taking mm-hmm. like an MLM or anything like that. But when you're speaking about and evangelizing to people who may not know yet, or maybe like fringe, right? Like they're they're close to the line, but like they just need like just a little bit more of a nudge, mm-hmm. kind of what would be words of encouragement or what you would speak out of in terms of being able to maybe just nudge them a little bit farther. I mean, I feel like that varies person to person. Um, whether it be what my relationship is with them, if there is any relationship, or just asking those questions and actively listening to see 
what are they needing? Where are they not being fulfilled? Where is that void? Where is that hole? Um, And then depending on what their answer is, being able to speak in that and bring the Bible into it and be like, hey, here's what the Bible says about this. Like, from what I hear, this is where I would just love to encourage you. And like, this is what the Lord says. And, you know, yeah, just being able to speak to them in that way and whatever specific capacity that they need. Let's say a hypothetical example. Okay. They get over that line, right? Like, okay, I want to do this sinner's prayer. I want to accept. I'm fully in, sold out. I don't know fully what this means yet, but I feel like I, I need to do this. Like, I feel something in my soul stirring. They cross that line. What happens next, right? Because some of the people who are like, okay, I accepted that, or I did this, and I'm in, but now what happens, right? Like, in your experience, what have you been able to, like, speak into that for someone. Yeah. I mean, that actually came up in a conversation a few weeks ago and, you know, the person was just like, well, I mean, like I can pray and I can go to church and do all these things. And I was like, don't worry so much about the actions. It was like, there's no set, like, okay, here's the checklist. You accepted the Lord. Now you do this, 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 like, it's not, it's not like that. Like, yes, we do those things, but it's not to just mark something off the list. So my encouragement in those moments is, hey, like, let's work on completely giving ourselves and submitting and humbling ourselves and handing that seed of lordship of our lives. Because we all operate as our own king, as our own queen, as our own lord of our life. Like, we make the executive decisions because we want to X, Y, Z. Fully submitting that over to the Lord is the first step. And that is what I encourage. And I'm like, hey, if you need scripture, boom, boom, boom. Here's where that'll encourage you. And then I encourage people to go to John. I'm like, hey, read the book of John. It's a good place to start. It was like, don't start Old Testament. Like, leave the Old Testament alone for a bit. Like, that's going to be confusing. Um, But start with the book of John. See why ultimately Jesus came and like what your decision truly means. Like, Let's go back to the beginning and see, okay, we sinned, Jesus was born, Jesus came, Jesus died, and here's why. And let's understand the basic principles and foundations. And through that, the Lord's going to speak to them and just trusting like, hey, you don't need to completely get it. um, And you don't need to have all this head knowledge or do the right things or don't worry about that. But like, just go in with an open heart and say, Lord, Show me whatever you have for me and then go into it and just start reading and seeing what he speaks to you because 90% of the time it's through his word. Like he's given us a physical book of him speaking directly to us, even if it was 2000 years ago, like it's still relevant today and as relevant as it was then. So just I encourage them go through one of the gospels and see what the Lord speaks and like just continue to ask him to speak to you and show you different things and meet you where you're at. That's good stuff. No, I wish, wish I had the Bible. I wasn't like, grab me like this, the manual. This, thing, this right. is the manual right this here. Right here. <laughs> Read this thing. It helps. I promise. I swear. Like, it's foolproof. It's great. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, another question I would have, I'm trying to think of one, would be talk about what it's like to, you know, for someone who may not be like too familiar, like may have, for example, let's say church hurt. That's a big thing, right? Talk about what, you know, if you've experienced any, like what that's been like, because of course you grew up in the church, right? With, with your dad and all that. But like, maybe you've been, you know, had friends or family that have like experienced that church or talk about what that's been like, kind of, I guess, discipling or encouraging or motivating someone to, to try it again, even if that was their experience in the past. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all sinners and that includes the church. Like there is no perfect church because we're all simple, broken people. Like that's the reality of it and while yes there are certain churches that i would encourage people to go to and certain ones that i wouldn't based on doctrine based on beliefs based on the things that are most important to your spiritual growth i would just encourage them like you know i'm so sorry and like i'm not taking away from the validity of what they what this church did or what you experienced here but just know not every church is like that but also acknowledging like yes we are sinful people. There is bound to be 
a not perfect church and every church has its areas of sin. Like, I'm so sorry that that was your experience. That is not all of them. And if you give it another chance, like pray about it, think about it. But ultimately, like God does call us to gather as one, as his church, as believers and to be spoken into um, by those he anoints as pastors and preachers and just who have that knowledge to help us in our walk. So I would just encourage them to give it a second shot and just try not to hold the sins of someone else and make it such a general broad thing because that's not necessarily the case. Speaking on kind of like that, that challenging aspects, I guess for you personally, what's the hardest part about being a Christian? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> I would say not knowing everything because I'm a control freak. Um, and I wish more than anything that God would just like lay out all the stuff, lay it out on the table. Tell me exactly what I need to do and I'll do it. Like, Lord, wherever you want to take me, I will go. But like, can you can you let me know what the plan is so that I can act in accordance? And God doesn't always work that way. Like he reveals certain things to us and not everything. And we just have to trust. And I would say that's the hardest part because we're supposed to completely trust him. And if we know everything, there's no reason to trust. Like there's no reason to have faith because we know all the answers. And then it becomes about us doing it instead of him doing it. And so I would say that's my biggest struggle is just, especially right now, what I'm trying to work through and like trust him in with future and what he has for me like lord can you just make it clear already like i would just like to know which way to go and like i trust you but like can you give me a little something and just being able to submit that every day and knowing you may not know when you want to know and that's okay but if you're being diligent and faithful where you're at like God uses every season and everything that we go through and turns it around for his purpose and his glory. So I would say that's just the hardest thing is trying to go about the day to day with either little to no information or when you're trying to work through something big and you're wanting the clarity and you're wanting the answers now because we live in a very, you want it now, you get it now society and not having that can be tough, but. No, it's called instant gratification. 100%. Right? Couldn't think of the word, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> there you go. You want to microwave it, right? You're oh, like, yeah. My TV dinner, throw it in there. I'm already done. All right, cool. That took like 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Not easy. So now we're going to play a game. Okay. You have 60 seconds to answer 10 questions trivia related about yourself. Three, two, one. Where were Adam and Eve born? They were created in the Garden of Eden. Number two. How many innings in a softball game? Nine, seven. All right, number three. How many brothers did Joseph have? 12, I, I think know. it's 12. What is the first book of the Bible? Genesis. How many plagues did God send on Egypt? Four. Who was the first king of Israel? Oh, I don't know. Name of the town Jesus was born? Bethlehem. Where did Jesus walk on water? Jordan, Nazarene, <laughs> Galilee. <laughs> what disciple denied Jesus three times? Peter. And last question, who won the Super Bowl last year? Oh, heck if I know. I have no idea. I don't even know who played last year. <laughs> what is the Kansas City Chiefs? What? The Kansas City Chiefs. They won? Yes. Okay, that's great. who they play? The Philadelphia Eagles. Oh, cool. Good job. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Why would you ask me a football question? <laughs> I told you it was random. All right, here Clearly. we go. Clearly. So you got that one, you got one. What, am I getting a score got, here? Yes, uh, out of 10, <laughs> snort. Um, you said seven. Okay, you got that one. Let's see. According to your score, one, two, three, four, five, six. Ooh, wait. You got... Six out of ten? You did. Hey, that's not bad. That's, that's more than half. That's a D. That's all right. <laughs> that's more than half. <laughs> all right. All right, y'all. That's going to be the end of the show. Thanks for coming on. Good Thanks stuff. for having me. Great stuff. If you haven't already, guys, subscribe to the podcast. Smash that like button. Drop a comment. Until next time, y'all. Peace out. Peace out.